Well, good morning so far. We'll see if I don't blew it. God is good, and He's doing some great things in the life of our church, and we're excited for just being able to partner with Him and go where He wants us to go. So over the last few weeks, we have been in a series where we are focusing on either changing and or confirming our ideas about God that, so that we understand that God is, in fact, big enough, that He is big enough to help us through everything and anything that we face in life. So far, we've unpacked the idea that God is big enough to help us conquer our sin. Last week, we spent some time unpacking the idea that God is big enough to heal all of our diseases. Not just all our diseases, not just your disease, but my disease. That God is big enough to heal my disease. This morning, as we kind of unpack together, I want to address another common problem that sometimes we as Christians face uh, in our journey, and that is the doubt that sometimes hinders our confident, or dare I say, blessed assurance in the fact that God loves us and has plans to give us and continue to lead us in. Doubt can be a serious issue in the life of a Christian. It can leave us feeling empty. It can paralyze us. It can uh, create fear that comes as a result of our doubts that keep us from moving forward, that keep us from seeking help, and keep us from going all out. Keep us from finding and experiencing the healing and the help and hope that we are after and in desperate need of. And so it is imperative, I believe, that we understand that God is big enough to handle, not just handle, to remove some of our doubts. I'm just going to wait because you really are killing me if you're not going to respond to that. Right? God is big enough to handle some of our doubts, right? Oh, all right. I, I was waiting for the voice over here. You changed sides on me. All right, it's good. All right. No! God is big enough to handle every single doubt that comes our way. Right, Every single doubt, every single fear, every single thing that would creep in and hinder us from knowing and having confidence in who God is and what He is calling us to do and who He's calling us to be, we can have every confidence that we need in Christ because He has made it so. God is big enough to remove all, say it with me, all, all of our doubts, right? He's big enough to cover all of them. And let's hear that and let's learn that this morning. Keep that ingrained in our heads today. I want you to turn with me, if you would, to Luke's Gospel, chapter 24. Luke's Gospel, chapter 24, third book in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, chapter 24. Where the story we're picking up, Jesus has lived his life. He has suffered, he has died, and he has risen again. And now we find ourselves in this phase of Jesus' life where he has now um, gone through all of this work here on earth, and now he is just simply proving, he's simply demonstrating that he is, in fact, who he says he is, and he's encouraging his followers and disciples to have faith and confidence in who he is, and uh, I want to invite you to follow along in the story as we look at that together this morning. I'm not going to read the whole story. I'm going to get us started in one packet the rest of the way this morning. Would you stand with me for the reading of God's word? Luke chapter 24, and uh, we're going to pick up at verse 36. So what's happening here is the, the men who were on their way home from Jerusalem, on their way to Emmaus, were talking about everything that had gone on. They were trying to deal with understanding what was happening. And all of a sudden, this individual meets them on the road, and they begin to have conversation. And by the time they just about get to Emmaus, they find out that the person that they had been talking with and sharing with was, in fact, Jesus Christ. And they just can't believe it. And they realize that this is some significant news that they can't just go to Emmaus now. They've got to go back seven miles, back to Jerusalem, and they've got to go tell the people what had, in fact, just happened because this is not normal, right? This doesn't just happen. This isn't just an any day occurrence. And so we pick up the story where these two individuals are now finding themselves in the upper room with the disciples, and they're sharing what's going on and what has happened. Verse 36, and just as they were telling about it. Jesus himself was suddenly standing there among them, and he said, peace be with you. But the whole group was terribly frightened, thinking they were seeing a ghost. Why are you frightened, he asked. Why do you doubt who I am? 
Look at my hands. Look at my feet. You can see that it's in fact really me. Trust me and make sure that I am not a ghost because ghosts don't have bodies as you see that I do. And as he spoke, he held out his hands for them to see and he showed them his feet. Let's pray. Father God, we love you so much and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord God, that you have gone out of your way to prove that you are who you are, to prove that you, in fact, do love us and that you would do whatever it takes to demonstrate that love for us. We, Lord, we thank you that you are active in our lives, that you didn't just kind of set things in motion and set us on our, on our own way. Lord God, today we are studying this truth that you are big enough to remove our doubts. Lord, my prayer today that is as we leave this place, we will walk away in confidence, knowing that there are no doubts that are worth holding on to. Lord God, we love you and pray that you would lead us in that truth this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. So here we are. Jesus has appeared to his disciples after his resurrection and he is proving to them that he is in fact alive and real as he stands before them. As he appears suddenly before his disciples, he stands there in this otherworldly experience, so, so to speak, to them. And he says to them, look at, my at the holes in my hands and look at the holes in my feet. See for yourselves, use your eyes and see that it is in fact I, Jesus, the one you have been living with, sharing life with, doing ministry with, crying with, experiencing all of life with together. It is me. If seeing it is enough, go ahead and touch the holes in my hands and in my feet. And if you continue to read on, you see, if that still isn't enough, I'm hungry. What more evidence do you need than a man who needs some food to eat? Right? Jesus was hungry. I knew I loved Jesus. The man is hungry. Feed the man. And so they gave him some broiled fish. And he filled his stomach. And they watched him eat. Because certainly a ghost or some dead person would not do that. Yes, he is in fact alive. Yes, it is in fact Jesus, the one they whom had lived with. He is no longer dead. He is alive. And he is standing in front of them. And it's, as this proof is unveiled to the disciples, they are absolutely made clear and confident that whatever doubts they were holding, whatever fears were starting to creep in, they no longer had to hold them because here Jesus was in the flesh, right in front of them. Wow, there's some confidence in that. And I bet you, you've thought this like I have, that you think it's a little bit unfair that God made it in his design and plan that you would be born today and not 2,000 years ago where you could have been one of those disciples to literally see the holes in his hands and in his feet, right? Right, we wish we would have had, if I had that kind of proof, if, if I was a disciple, Right? If I was a disciple, there is no way I would have gone running and hiding when the Romans came. Right? There's no way. I would have been all in. I would have been his number one fan. I would have walked with him. I would have talked with him. I would have fought with him. I would have been with Peter pulling out the sword. Right? I would have done whatever it took because this is Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God, the one who is going to fix all things. Of course I would. I'll let you think that, because that makes me feel good. Of course, that's what I want, but it's not probably my reality. I mean, even the disciples who lived with Jesus found themselves in this place where the world was crazy around them, and they weren't able to make sense of it all, and Jesus had to physically demonstrate that he was, in fact, alive. We'd like to be able to read that story. We'd like to be able to think about it and internalize it and feel it and say, of course, now we can have confidence and not doubt that Jesus is alive. We cannot doubt that he is active and for us and that he has what we need as we walk through this journey in life. And yet, we find ourselves allowing doubt to creep in from time to time, don't we? Creep in because we haven't seen his hands and his feet. Because we didn't get to watch him consume the fish. But if we could have, it would have been so amazing. We find ourselves living in a culture and society that everywhere around us is trying to explain a world that is without God. And sometimes we might even be tempted to believe them. 
which in turn finds us doubting God himself. So this morning, I want us to look a little bit closer at how Jesus was able to remove these doubts for his disciples and through what Jesus does for them, find the effort, his, this effort to prepare us to be in a place where we can face the doubts that creep in that sometimes hinder our confidence in him. A closer look at this encounter of the resurrected Christ with his disciples demonstrates Christ's complete effort to remove all of their doubts. The first thing that we notice here as we start looking at this passage in verse 36 is that Jesus simply reappears to the disciples. He simply engages their eyes to say, look and see that it is in fact me. These disciples have gathered together. They're discussing all uh, that has taken place in their world in these recent days. The world around them is spinning. Everything that they had hoped for, everything that they had dreamed about, that they believed in who Jesus was, seemingly was coming to a scree screeching halt in front of them. Nothing was as if they thought it would be. And now to make matters worse, now they find themselves gathered together having to deal with this information that has come from the women who were just at the tomb and the tomb is now empty. Jesus is not there. They're claiming that he's alive. What are we to do with this information? Now we get a knock on the door and it's these men who were on their way to Emmaus and have now come back to us to say, you will not believe this, but we've just been on a walk home and we realized at the end of that journey that the person, our companion that we were walking with is Jesus Christ himself. He is not dead, he is alive. It sounds like good words and we want to say amen, don't we? But put yourself in the mind of the disciples in this moment. It doesn't make any sense. We saw him die. We saw him suffer with our own eyes. There is no way that Jesus is alive. It's not the way the human body works. Dead means dead. Dead means no breath of life. Dead means you are in the grave, you are in the ground, you don't get up and start walking again. We've prayed for that with loved ones, haven't we? We've wanted that. It'd be a little creepy if it ever did, but, you know, we want it. But here we are in verse 36, and Jesus now appears in the midst of all of this confusion and all of this questioning and all of the doubts and fear, chaos that is going on. And Jesus appears, and he appears with these words. Peace be with you. Jesus knew that in seeing him this way, it would be shocking and maybe even a bit frightening for them. And so he leads his introduction with a word and sentiment that peace and calmness should be the foundation. I imagine it was one of those moments where the disciples began to rub their eyes and wonder, am I really seeing what I think I'm seeing? Like, there's no way I'm really, truly witnessing. I've got to be dreaming. I'm pinching myself, right? This can't not be happening. I want it to be happening, but it's not real. Is it? Jesus appears to the disciples in the upper room. He was encouraging them to use their eyes to see as proof that he was, in fact, alive and real. In the midst of their storm, in their swirling, in their questions, in their fears, and in their doubts, Jesus appears in the room, and it's as if for a few moments the calm in the storm just settles. And they're able to get some clarity and perspective. Much like the eye of a hurricane. Right? If you know anything about a hurricane, you know how devastating those winds can be at minimum 74 miles an hour, often more greater than that. Rains, pounding rains, wa waters rising, flood becomes a concern. Everywhere around you in the midst of that storm is chaos until the eye comes passing through. And then there's calmness. There is peace. In the eye of the storm, you would have no idea that there is a storm raging around you. Because in the midst of that place, there is perfect peace. So it is with the storms of life. With the Lord at our center, there is a calm and peace, even in the darkest and fiercest storms of life. Even when the greatest doubts and questions and fears begin to creep up in our hearts and in our minds, when we put our eyes on the person of Christ, 
when we center our focus and attention in the person of Christ, there is a calmness. There is a peace that Jesus offers. Peace be with you. In the midst of the crisis, that is the instruction that Christ has now given to us. Peace be with you. The peace which Jesus gives to those uh, whom he loves is rich and deep and long-lasting. It is not just the absence of war or strife. It is something much more positive. It is in his peace, the peace that passes all understanding, which guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, as Paul says in Philippians. The first thing that we see that Jesus does is simply engage our eyes so that we can see. From there, we see that Jesus then reassures his disciples. Now that they have seen him, he goes on to reassure them in verses 37 through 43. As Jesus appears, the first thing that we notice about the disciples in this room is that they are frightened. They are uncertain about what they are experiencing. They are not just having some minor concerns. They are experiencing almost a whole body fright. This is not happening. This is just not real. They wonder what they are looking at. Are they looking at a spirit that was impersonating Jesus, their friend and teacher? Are they looking at a spirit who is uh, from the world of the dead? Is it a ghost? Again, the idea that Jesus was actually alive and the man who was standing in front of them was in fact uh, the same person who they witnessed with their own eyes just a few days before be beaten, hung on the cross, who died, who was then laid in the tomb for his final resting place. For this man to be the same person had to be an incredible step of faith for those disciples. Just as much as it would be for you and I in this moment if Jesus were to suddenly appear among us. Sure, we would love it, but we would certainly start rubbing our eyes and start wondering, are we seeing what we really think we are seeing? Jesus, knowing what they were feeling, he took it upon himself to dispel their fear giving them the physical proof that they needed in order to engage their hearts so that they could believe. How does he do that? He does it two simple ways. First, he says, look at my hands and feet, and if that's not enough, touch them. Touch them and see that I am who I am. And from there, there's still a fear, and so he goes a step further, and he says, look, I'm hungry, feed me. I will prove to you that I am, in fact, alive. Because certainly a dead man or a ghost is not going to eat. I will prove it to you. I will reassure you that I am the one who you think I am. Not only have the disciples seen Jesus now with their own eyes in his resurrected state, but now Jesus has gone a step further and reassured them by giving them proof to know that Jesus is who he is. It does us no good or those that we interact with no good to simply bury our doubts and somehow dismiss our doubts as if they're not real and they're not true. Is God really in this? Is God really moving? Yes, those questions, right? It does us no good to just ignore them. We have to work towards engaging them so, in fact, we understand that God is, in fact, in work in our lives. Jesus invites us here to examine the evidence of who he is and what he has done and what he is doing. Without doing this, we find ourselves in a place where it is very easy not to believe, and we allow this doubt to creep in and fester and get bigger. And it ultimately hinders us to be able to follow faithfully the way that the Lord has called us to go. The closer we look at the facts around us, the evidence around us, the closer we begin to see the one who dispels our doubts. See, Jesus is very good in what he requires of us and he asks of us. He just simply puts himself in the place to say, look, you don't believe me, test me. See that I am who I am. See that I am who I say that I am, who I am proving that I am. I will be here for you. Whatever doubt you have, you can see me. I will reassure you with a heart to believe in what you are seeing. And then finally, in this last section that we didn't read this morning, we see that Jesus reveals his plan. Here, Jesus attempts to connect the dots of our doubts the dots of the doubts that the disciples were experiencing, to remove any trace of skepticism and make clear the plan that is unfolding before him. Jesus draws their attention to these words of instruction that he gave them when he was living with them, and he pointed out how he, in fact, was the fulfillment of all that had been written about him 
since the days of Moses. And in so Jesus was stoking their minds so that they could understand. You know, God is good in the way that he proves himself to us. Because he proves himself to us over and over and over again in, in what we see. Engaging us to use our eyes to see that he is in fact real and alive around us. He engages us in our hearts to believe. But what I have found in my journey of faith with the Lord is that when I gain the most confidence in the Lord is when I submit myself to the plan that he has given me and I follow through in what he's asked me to do. You know what I'm saying? So what I'm saying this morning is when I have found the, dis the doubt being dispelled the best is when I simply take a step of faith and I trust the Lord to, to go the direction that I believe he's calling me to go. I might not be 100% sure and certain that it is the Lord in that moment. It very well could be the pizza. But it's probably the Lord. I've come to learn that. So I'm going to take this step of faith and I'm going to trust that the Lord is in it, knowing that if he isn't in it, he's going to thump me upside the head and I'll go a different direction. Right? I don't have to doubt. I don't have to fear or worry. I just simply need to go. Right? I just need to make it happen because that's what God told me to do, I think. And when I do... When I actually go and make that happen and I find myself moving where God told me to go, even though it seems like really weird that now pastor's sitting and letting them preach from the audience, even though I'm just sitting there, like, I didn't see that coming. Did you see that coming? You didn't see that coming, did you? I didn't see it coming either. I just kind of, I'm kind of, I'm winging it now. Just don't tell them, okay? All right. So, you know, this, like sometimes God just says, do something a little bit crazy that nobody expects and maybe somebody will pay attention. Okay, well, let me do it. And so we start moving, and sometimes then we start thinking, okay, I'm moving, but now I'm really getting scared, because now I really have no idea. At least when I was on safe ground up here, I have some confidence that I can go back to my notes and get back on track. See, there's a reason I have a table sometimes, because you don't want to know where my mind will go if I don't have my notes. We'll get ourselves in trouble. See, this is part of the journey. This is part of the process I have learned that I just need to go. I just need to be where God wants me to be and trust him that he's going to walk me through that because he's said he's going to be with me. And guess what? He's going to be with me even though if I wasn't supposed to step down here. Right? Even if I'm going where I'm not supposed to go and I'm making somebody feel weird and awkward because now pastor just sat down next to me and he's preaching and he's like, is he really doing that? I am. Are you embarrassed yet? Just a little bit. I'm sorry. I'm just picking on you. Okay, that's good. All right. So, you know, sometimes we do some really crazy things and we're like, she's going to hate me afterwards, but that's okay. That's all right. You know, you do some crazy things and you second guess yourself like, should I have done that? Look, if we're trying to follow the Lord, right? If we're trying to do what he's asked us to do, he's going to walk with us. He's going to make it okay. It, it doesn't mean it's going to be easy. It doesn't mean it's going to be simple. It doesn't mean all of the problems are going to go away. But guess what? God is with us. And he's going to bring us through it. There's confidence in that. Jesus reveals his plans to us when we simply take a step of faith. And he usually doesn't require us just to jump off. Right? Usually he doesn't say, just go and just... Now, sometimes he does. He makes you move from Iowa and say, I'm going to Pennsylvania. Or Idaho, and make you go to Pennsylvania, right? Right? Like sometimes you do some crazy things. You're like, well, okay, that's a pretty big jump. Sometimes I'm going to do that. But more often than not, he just wants you to take a step. And that step means you probably still have a foot on solid ground somewhere. But trust me, what I've learned is when I do that, my fear and doubt begin to dissipate. And my confidence in who Christ is grows exponentially. So church, this is what we're working towards. Faith in Jesus is not closing our minds to the evidence of the truth around us. It's opening up the scriptures to better understand the workings of God, the wonder of his fulfillment of Christ, and receiving words of comfort and guidance for today, as well as the sure hope in the promises of God for the future. So I want to point out just a few things here this morning that we can... Uh, use to deal with our doubt in practical ways where we can prepare ourselves to respond to what God is doing in our hearts and in our lives. And the first, we're just going to follow the model that Christ gave us as he met with his disciples and he proved to them who he is. 
And the first is that we need to learn to use our eyes to see. Right? We need to use our eyes to see. And we do that by reading and meditating on the truth of God's love and His plans for us and His Word. Now, as Christians, we do this fairly well at first, right? We learn to read the Scripture. We even go as far as studying the Scripture, right? But do we always go as far as meditating on the Scripture? You see, at first, when I first was thinking through this, I was kind of thinking that study and meditate kind of were synonymous, right? They're the same thing. But when I really focus on it a little bit more, I realize that I can study a lot of things and know a lot about a lot of things. But when I start to meditate on something and I focus my thoughts and energy on it and I give permission to not just know about it, but to invite it in to shape the way that I think and the way that I believe and the way that I behave, all of a sudden meditation takes on a whole new meaning to me. So when God is engaging us to use our eyes to see, yes, he wants us to read. Yes, he wants us to study. But more importantly, he wants us to meditate. Because he doesn't want to leave us that way. Here, I said this in the first service. I've used this phrase often, but here's the proof of God. The proof of God is that he loves you. Because I don't. No, I'm just kidding. No, he loves you just the way that you are. Right? No matter how, what you're dealing with, no matter what struggle you have, no matter how much you don't think you deserve how much he loves you right now, God loves you exactly the way you are, and that's enough. It is. He loves you that much. But he loves you so much, he refuses to leave you that way. He refuses to leave you that way. And you learn that by focusing your attention on this truth. Jesus says uh, in John chapter 8, you are truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings. We skip that part because we like the next part. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free, right? You know that, right? We, we know that phrase. We own it and embrace it. But the first part of that is important and we can't miss it. You, will, you are truly my disciples. Truly, you are. If. If you hold to my teachings. What are my teachings? It's the truth that sets us free. We have eyes to see so that we can then recognize the difference between conviction and condemnation. Doubts of, about our salvation can develop if we do not understand the difference between these two. Conviction of sin is a natural part of the Christian's life. And it should lead to confession, repentance, and restoration of joy and peace in our lives. Whereas condemnation, on the other hand, brings despair over the guilt of our sin because in it a person has no hope of forgiveness and being cleansed. Romans chapter 8, verse 29, the Apostle Paul tells us that at salvation, God's Holy Spirit began the conforming work in us so that we can become the image of Christ. And then in John 14, 26, we are told by Jesus himself that the Spirit of God began to convict us of sin and teach us the ways of God. Do you hear that? The Spirit of God is the convictor of sin, which means conviction is not a bad thing. You understand that? Conviction is actually a very good thing. And yet we often push it away. The difference is, is we need to understand that there's a difference between conviction and condemnation. Because in conviction, the Spirit of God is wooing us. He loves us just the way that we are, but He's refusing to leave us that way, so He instills conviction to say, don't do this, do this. And the question is, we can study it and just simply, okay, that's nice, or we can meditate on it and say, okay, what do I need to do to change? And begin to do it. Right? Whereas condemnation says, I'm just a miserable, awful person because I can never get it right and I'm just going to stay here and continue to be miserable and awful because I'm never going to get it right and I'm just going to keep doing what I do because that's what I do. We've got to understand the difference between the two. He's given us eyes to see. When we experience the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we may feel more sinful than we have ever felt before accepting Christ's payment for sin, but that's only because He's made us aware. We may feel more lost than ever, but don't be deceived. You are still a child of God. And the right response is the conviction of sin. For the conviction of sin is to simply repent to the Lord. 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we claim to have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and not living in truth. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all wickedness and unrighteousness and uncleanliness. For those who have found peace with God through Jesus Christ, there is no condemnation, Paul reminds us in his letter to Romans. So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ. And because you belong to him, the power 
of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. He's given us eyes to see, but he's also given us hearts to believe. And we do that by another way, by recording our moments of revelation. Right? We record our moments of revelation. We simply do that by, by writing down how God has been faithful. We start by simply remembering the time when God first became real to us. When we first realized that God's love was true and genuine, that God was active in our lives, and we just simply record it and write it down. We do this in our church every week as we gather together in Joshua Stones, and we put the stones in here to simply mark God's faithfulness. To, to identify that God is still in the work of answering prayers in our life. And God's been pretty busy this year, right? But maybe we need to learn to take this to another level, to another step. And say, so we know that God's faithful. But maybe we need to take some time and write it down in a journal or in a notepad and detail out how God has specifically been faithful. Because, you know, in that moment, we don't need it because we're pretty confident in God because he's been faithful. But we need that writing because there may be a time when doubt begins to creep in and fear starts to prevail and the storm of life begins to get heavy and hard. And we can't remember as hard as we try we can't remember the times when God has answered prayer and we need to have a place where we can go back and simply read it we don't have to memorize it we don't have to be able to recall it in an instant we just have to be able to read it and bring it back to memory so that we can have hearts that believe and then with that we'll be able to begin to learn to resist the devil Jesus describes him as an enemy who comes to steal kill and destroy and even though he can't possibly snatch us out of God's hands, he certainly tries unceasingly to steal our peace and our joy. And he does so by sending the fiery darts of doubt into our minds, as we're told about in uh, Paul's letter to the Ephesians, which is why we need the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God, to ward out off those doubts, which then prepares us for James chapter 4, verse 7, to learn to submit ourselves, therefore, before God. In submitting ourselves before God, we then can resist the devil. And when we resist the devil, the promise is he will flee. Right? He will flee. He will run. Why? Because he has no choice. Why? Because we've taken out the space where doubt can creep in. Because we put ourselves in a place where the um, confidence that we have in Christ is greater than the doubt that we have in Christ. And the enemy can't win. And then finally, we find ourselves in uh, God engaging our minds so that we can understand where we learn to cry out for his rescue. You know, there's a great story in the scripture where Jesus is walking on earth and he's actually walking in the water and a storm is raging around and Peter's on the boat and he sees, sees Jesus and he recognizes that it's Jesus because he's got eyes to see. He's been walking with Jesus who has a heart that believes, but now he needs his mind to understand. And so he calls out to Jesus and says, let me come out to you. And Jesus gives him permission, says, come, come walk out to me. And so he does, he starts walking out on the water. And he's walking on the water. Make no mistake, Peter was walking on the water until he took his eyes off of Jesus. And he began to sink. And then he began to panic because he allowed, he allowed doubt and fear in the storm of life to start crash, crashing in again. And he did what only he could do in that moment and he cried out to the Lord, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. Sometimes the best thing, the only thing we can simply do is cry out, Lord, save me. Lord, help me. And maybe we find ourselves in a place of doubt and fear and the storm of life is raging around us. And maybe today your response just simply needs to be, Lord, help me. Lord, save me. Lord, I've taken my eyes off of you, the calm, the peace, the center of the storm, and I'm no longer there where I need to be because I'm now looking at the storm instead of looking at you, which is the peace that passes all understanding which is the calm in the midst of all of the chaos around me. I can live in this chaos as long as I keep my eyes on you because you remove all doubt. You remove all fear. You, Lord, can do this. Not only does Peter reach out and say, Lord, save me, but guess what happens? The scripture says immediately, in that instant, in that moment, Jesus reached out and he grabbed him. Then, of course, he scolded him, and he said, you of little faith, why do you doubt me? If you just keep your eyes on me, it would be all good. You would have nothing to worry about, nothing to fear. You can trust me. Keep our eyes fixed on them, and when we do that, then we can do what we all long to do and learn to rest in the knowledge that we, in fact, do belong to God. John chapter 10, verses 27 through 29. My sheep listen to my voice, 
and I know them. And then look at that next phrase. They listen to my voice, and I know them. And they follow me. They follow me. You understand? We listen to his voice. We know them. We have confidence in the voice of God. Doubt is dispelled. When we have confidence in the voice of God, we can follow Jesus without fear. We can go wherever he wants us to go, even if that means going into the lion's den. Even if that means going into a place uh, that is filled with people who don't believe the way that I believe, who act the way that I don't think is appropriate to act. It's not even moral, let alone Christian. Right? We can find ourselves going places. We can find ourselves going and doing things. If God is in it, we can go where he calls us to go. We can do what he's asked us to do. But only if our eyes are on the Lord. Because if not, then doubt begins to creep in. Doubt begins to hinder our journey. It stops us. It cripples us. It paralyzes us. And then the enemy does what he does. He steals, he kills, and destroys. I don't know what your area of doubt might be. Maybe you don't doubt the Lord's love for you. But maybe there's something specific in your journey that you've just kind of been questioning. I know that God can do it. I know that he is able to do it. But will he do it? It's the same question that the leper was asking of God that we talked about last week, right? The leper knew God can do it. God, you have the power. There was confidence that he had in God and what he could do. The question that he had is, would he? Would he do it for him? Maybe that's your question. Maybe your doubt isn't in the power and in the authority of God, but your doubt is in whether or not he cares and loves you enough to meet you where you are and to answer your prayer and your request. Maybe you've been praying for something for a very long time and you've just kind of gotten to a place where you just are starting to doubt. Is God even hearing? Is he even going to answer? Because in our timetable, he should have a long time ago. Maybe, just maybe, God is saying, look, I want to answer your prayer, but I want to answer it my way and not your way. And so maybe you just need to take a little bit of time to just kind of step back and use your eyes to see, open your heart to believe, and take your mind to a place where you can begin to understand what, in fact, God has on store for you and where he is leading you. Church, I'm going to invite you to pray with me this morning. And I don't know if there's an area of specific doubt that you're wrestling with, some question or fear that is holding you back, but I want to invite you today to just simply take a moment and just listen to the Lord. And I want you to see him appear before you. Many of you know him. Many of you have seen him before. Maybe not in his physical hands and in his feet, but you've seen him. You've seen him in your church. You've seen him in your friends. You've seen him in your family. You've seen him in circumstances that you faced. You've seen how he's been involved in the details of your life. Watch him appear to you today. Listen to him as he wants to reassure you that he is for you and not against you. That he will not leave you or forsake you, but will walk with you even through the fiercest of storms and will provide the calm that you need. And then let him put your mind at ease as you understand the road and the journey that he is calling you to travel. As you meditate on him, what is the next step? Most often, he's not asking you to jump the cavern. He just wants you to take another step. So what is that today? What step do you take today so that you can follow that plan and purpose? Father God, we love you so very much and we are grateful for your love. We are grateful, Lord God, that you are active and evident in our life. Lord Jesus, today, would you lead us? Would you show us your truth? Would you show us, Lord God, where the enemy would try to steal and kill and destroy our confidence in you? Would you give us the ability to be able to use our eyes and our hearts and our minds to dispel that, Lord God, to put ourselves in a place where we, Lord God, can have confidence in who you are and in what you are calling us to, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you. Help us keep our eyes on you, and in the midst of any storm that rages, we will experience your everlasting peace. We love you today, and all God's people said. Hey, have a great week. Let that darkness be dispelled.
and focus in on what God has for you in his hope.